All right, we are live. Welcome to the Appear on Zoe Epigenetic Performance Series. I'm Dr. Dan Sickler. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Appear on Zoe. And today we have a great guest on uh, one of a true friend of mine and uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever found in, the, in this space. And um, we're going to talk about entheogens and psychedelics and focus on more of the, of the science behind it, how it's being used in therapeutic approaches. Uh, this is part one of the interview. Um, Dr. Michael Hamilton is going to, to interview Dan later this week and talk about um, more of the spirituality components. And um, so I want to introduce you to, to Dan Engel. He's an MD practicing um, psychiatry. He's board certified in psychiatry and neurology. And his current practice combines functional medicine with integrative psychiatry to enhance the foundations of regenerative health and peak performance training. So he's right in alignment with the, the appear on Zoe ecosystem for sure. And what we want to do is we want to dive into this. And for those of you that are watching, um, if you post your questions in, in the, in the feed, we're going to try to get to questions depending on how much time we have and, um, may bring them up as we go. So we'll just, focus on that. So welcome, Dan. Uh, it's good to be with you as well, Dan. And I uh, <laughs> really appreciate what you guys are creating at Appear on. And it's just a uh, privilege to be a uh, support to your mission. Wonderful. I, it's so funny. It's so confusing because we have we have a bunch of mutual friends and and you go by Dr. Dan. I go by Dr. Dan. Yeah. So we have to clarify whenever we're, we're having conversations. And, and we go to the same barber. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we do. <laughs> so Let's let's dive right into this. Um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions um, and you know preconceived ideas about um, entheogens. And when I say entheogens, I'm talking about both the plant medicines and the synthetics. Um, so I want to kind of go through each individually and and talk about you know kind of how they work, uh, how we're using them in in therapeutics uh, as far as treatment and uh, even in performance. So uh, let's start off with, with talking about uh, one that currently um, it's not legal. I mean, it's, uh, it is legal if you are licensed to, to use it, but I'm talking about MDMA. Um, some people have, have experienced this as, as Molly or ecstasy, but that's a little different than what we're talking about with pure MDMA. Yeah. Yeah, what people tend to find on the street as ecstasy is cut with a lot of different stuff. Um, and if that means derivatives, a lot of swag, so to speak, or things that would speed up the system and feel similar. Uh, what MDMA does, and you know, th there's this huge psychedelic renaissance happening right now. And we could say that largely that's because of MDMA yeah. and MAPS' work with MDMA research. Rick Doblin and MAPS Association uh, stands for Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And they've been studying MDMA for 30 years. And MDMA really should have never been stuck in Schedule 1 in the first place uh, because there was um, a federal ruling that upheld MDMA for couples therapy as a legitimate therapeutic tool. And the administration trumped that took the vote out of the, the court's hands and stuck MDMA with all the other psychedelics into Schedule 1. Schedule 1 means there's no known medical benefit and it's highly addictive. Well, Which is, is ironic considering the number of studies that have been published on MDMA in, in therapeutic approaches. It's phenomenal. And in the way that it works, you can't really script a better molecule for PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's what it's going into phase three trials for right now. So past phase one, past phase two, into phase three. And while the feds are still going through all of the phase three trials so that it can be legalized as a therapeutic tool, it's, our, it's also gone through breakthrough um, green light treatment. So it's actually being rolled out simultaneously to phase three trials to small studies because the feds recognize that a lot of people are dying from PTSD and suicide and MDMA work. When you look at the data, it's so compelling that it needs to be offered. 
So there's a slow rollout period. It's only gone for like 50 clients to like eight different centers, but it's pretty phenomenal because that is happening as we speak. Yeah. We the Sorry, uh, how, can you explain how, it, how it's used in the clinical trials and in, in the therapeutic aspect, how they're, yeah. they're actually administering and, and the, uh, the ancillary components that are used with it? Totally. Um, you, when we think of MDMA as a molecule, you couldn't really script a better molecule for PTSD because what it does is it, it calms the fear center. It brings up greater connection between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus so you get better memory consolidation. And it also gives a, a bit of a witness perspective by enhancing uh, connection and blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. So you get better witness, less fear, and more memory so that you can associate the whole if there was one trauma or a series of traumas to be able to work through in a therapeutic context. So when we look at the data, the data is somewhere between 67 and 83% cure rate for chronic severe PTSD after only two to three sessions. Yep, repeat that. Right. I mean, that's yeah. incredible. It's incredible. So uh, the, the first set of studies in the phase one trials were 83% cure rate. Mm for chronic severe PTSD. And there's nothing like that on the planet, right? And, and, and the standard of care right now is psychopharmacology and cognitive behavioral therapy as a standard of care. And maybe that's 30 to 40% effective at lowering symptoms, but not curing it. And what we mean by curing it is people no longer have the symptoms or meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. So those numbers are in the therapeutic context. It's not like somebody just drops MDMA and is able to do their own therapy and it's in a, like a recreational setting. In the therapeutic context, it lasts about four to six hours. People have been screened for psychological and physical safety and they have a trauma trained therapist helping them work through their stuff, so to speak. And that's two to three sessions. And the data is so compelling that it's really thrusted into the limelight and then a lot of other medicines have now gained more curiosity because MDMA also has historically been this street drug. So if you know that in a therapeutic context, you can have a totally different outcome than in a recreational setting, then what does it mean for us to look at all of these medicines? Some of the natural medicines, some of the synthetics, and we can get into more of those as, you, as you'd like. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it just amazes me, especially since it had been available, uh, that they, they took it off. I mean, what are the potential side effects with, with MDMA? Well, M MDMA is an amphetamine derivative. So it's going to bump up your heart rate and blood pressure about 25 points each. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a history of cardiac problems, MIs, congestive heart failure, et cetera, um, or if they already run tachycardic or a really elevated um, heart rate, or if they're really hypertensive that's not controlled, those are more cardiovascular risk profiles that need to be taken into consideration. Um, and those are the big ones. There are other things if people have a lower seizure threshold, that could be a consideration. Um, and those are the, kind of the big low hanging fruit, so to speak physiologically and then psychologically um, because it's so safe there really aren't a whole lot of psychological contraindications um, it just so it's so good for de-armoring the system so to speak and helping people come into a heart opened safe experience internally especially if they're connected with a therapist they feel safe with to be able to get into all of their material so it's kind of classic for the, the the war veteran coming off the battlefield so to speak but it's also very good for people who are just the, the usual neurotic worried well, because <laughs> we're all yeah. coming around something that's holding us back from being our most authentic self. Well, and, and you know, that brings up a really good point. I mean, the criteria for PTSD, most people think of that as having to do with, with trauma uh, or with, with war related traumas, with uh, events, life events like a rape or something that just had, a huge impact like that, but m most people are walking around with deeply embedded trauma that, that they really aren't aware of that. I've heard a lot of people with the MDMA were able to bring that up and, and, and really get some clarity around um, the events. 
Absolutely. Yeah, many people who either forgot totally that there was deep, long-standing childhood adverse experiences, or they're called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, that tend to program our mind and our views about who we are and who the world is. And do we even experience safety and intimacy or self-worth when we view ourselves in the mirror or we take that honest inventory? All of these things get programmed before we're even in elementary school. So it's hard to get the narrative really even out of just talk therapy alone. And well, let's bring up this other thing called complex PTSD, which is classically PTSD was like this really big event where you thought you were going to die. But complex PTSD, PTSD is because of a long standing kind of threshold of a lot of events throughout a person's life that have the same downstream effect of keeping somebody in a hyper startled response or disconnected from who they are or that experience of safety within themselves or just the ability to be fully authentic and to express themselves um, freely. Yeah, so as far as the experience that people have with MDMA, I know a lot of people are, they'll, they'll say, wow, you, you know, they're afraid of it, I guess, um, is, is what I've heard from people. Um, because they, they think of it as really being out of control, um, you know, something that's really altering them in a way that it, that is uncomfortable. But what is the typical experience of a user with MDMA? Because I've, I've heard things from it's just this unconditional love that occurs, this, this ability to look at memories with no emotional components. So um, what, what have you heard? Those are, those are good descriptions. Uh because it's not a classic psychedelic, it's more of an empathogen. Uh, you have this uh, experience of being met and mirrored and the mirror neurons get kicked on. You can really feel the experience of being seen, understood, validated. And uh, it, because of that witness perspective, it does allow just enough distancing from the core wounds to be able to look at them more effectively, to be able to see how they got instilled, who was responsible for embedding them, what they learned as a result. And this isn't about like just curing trauma, so to speak. This is about incorporating these different aspects of ourselves, the victim, the child, the person that felt un, uh, incapable of dealing with that really uncomfortable experience and situation a long time ago. It's about bringing these different parts of ourselves back home into an integrated whole, into the experience of a greater um, wholeness of the complexity of life. And that includes mm. reclaiming that traumatized part of ourselves so that we can be more mature and actually um, use that as leverage and wisdom to live a better life. I love that. That's beautiful. Um, so what's your your take on um, this actually getting off of the schedule one? I mean, what's our time frame potential on that? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, <laughs> for, I think for the last half a dozen years, every year, Rick Doblin's been asked that question. He says two years. <laughs> and so that's the standard now. I expect that it's probably going to be somewhere between 18 and 24 months. Nice. Um, because expanded access and the rollout is already happening. And there's a lot of trauma prior to this like now global trauma that just got awakened in this last few weeks. So trauma isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. And this is the best trauma tool that we have on the planet that we know of right now. Yeah, we, we were talking about after this, uh, this uh, event that we're in at the moment, I think there's gonna be a lot of people with uh, PTSD. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's huge. So uh, let's move on to uh, psilocybin. Uh, this is uh, more of a plant-based. Um, so we're, we're moving from a synthetic into, into plant-based. Uh, what, what, what is the landscape on psilocybin? Yeah, it's a good segue to go from MDMA to psilocybin because it's another medicine that's in phase three trials right now. Mm -hmm. It's also been given the green light as a breakthrough treatment by the feds and this time for tr chronic treatment-resistant depression. 
And the reason being is because psilocybin is really effective for depression. And it's also effective for the other psychiatric epidemics that are happening right now. And those being depression, number one, but anxiety, PTSD, addiction, and chronic pain. Psilocybin is good for all five of those in different iterations. Like it's not great necessarily as a medicine for chronic pain syndromes, but a very specific pain syndrome called um, cluster headaches, which feels like you have a knife stuck into your temple, which is a really intense one. So fascinating how a psychedelic and psilocybin is more of a classic psychedelic would be good for a pain syndrome, All right? So it's, it's a fascinating uh, molecule. It's active ingredient is DMT, um, which engenders that psychedelic experience in the psychedelic state. It goes back in the fossil records a million years, and it's likely we've been foraging on psilocybin mushrooms even before we turned into our current Homo sapien like iteration. Yeah. Prior to that, when we were Homo erectus and foraging around on berries and mushrooms, it might have been part of what stimulated this massive growth in our prefrontal cortex in a very short period of time, about 200,000 years ago. Yeah, and this is there. I mean, this is in very respectable universities where this where this research is being done. I mean, this is uh, John Johns Hopkins has some wonderful data coming out on on even single dose treatments with psilocybin. Yeah, it has. If we just looked at those different constellation of syndromes and symptom clusters that I mentioned, it has an eighty percent success rate for nicotine dependence in one treatment which wow. is phenomenal. There's nothing else on the planet that yeah. holds that kind of like bar. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's so safe, there's no LD50. If you took a bucket load of psilocybin as, as like dried mushrooms, you would puke it out, yeah. which is what, one of the benefits of the natural medicines. Natural medicines have natural safeguards built in. So if we take too much, we tend to puke it out, purge it out, get it out. There's no LD50. It's extraordinarily safe. And fewer people even show up to the emergency department high on psilocybin than high on cannabis. And part of that's just because the cannabis these days is so intense and people take a lot of edibles and they don't know what they're getting into. Uh, but psilocybin, you're right, has some excellent data and there's great information coming out of Johns Hopkins, uh, the Royal College of London. Um, if you looked at the classic... Um, picture of the, the brain on drugs, so to speak, you'd see this psilocybin composite fMRI, which essentially looks like, you know, 10% of uh, a spider web's filaments lit up. But on psilocybin, you see like 90% of those filaments lit up. And it, it's really good when you see that, you know, because a picture is worth a million words at that point. It's really impressive to see how much interneuronal communication is start starts happening. You have areas of the brain speaking that wouldn't have otherwise been in direct communication and contact. So that's the macro dose. And then you have a lot of people now also working with psilocybin in the micro dose arena because it's very effective as an antidepressant and it's helped a ton of people get off of psychopharmaceuticals who were stuck with treatment resistant depression, unable to get off of their pharmaceuticals using subsyndromal or a really small amount of psilocybin in a microdose arena, which is usually every two to three days, one tenth of a journey dose. All of this research comes from Jim Fadiman's work and has helped a lot of people be able to break through that depression barrier. Now I was, uh, I was reading something on the, on the study, one of the studies that was done at Hopkins, uh, they did a single, you know, large dose um, treatment and, can't remember what the percentage was, but it was it was over eighty percent of the participants had rated it one of the most impactful experiences uh, in their life, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, and th these are psychedelic naive people who have never used a psychedelic, but may have done something like meditation or some kind of self development work, and opt into an experience. And ninety four percent said it was in the top five spiritual experiences they had ever had. And that lasted 14 months after the study concluded. They still felt the, the lingering effects of it. So it's, a, it's an amazing medicine and it's been actually getting a lot of press too um, in the end of life transition. 
There's a re really mm -hmm. good movie called um, Psilocybin, A New Understanding. And it showcases four or five different people with stage four cancer going through the process of becoming now more in touch with death and the death process and the, the transition from this life into where we're, wherever we go next. And to see the peace and to hear their experiences of the peace of being able to now engage the process, not necessarily wanting to die, but being much more easy with that transition. So not fighting it so much. And ideally that's what we have at the end of this road. And, you know, when we shed this body and transition to wherever we go next yeah. is the ability to do that well with dignity, with compassion, uh, with less regret and less fear, but more openness and curiosity. And it's kind of curious to me, I see now in my uh, whiteboard, that's not a mushroom in the background, by the way. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. I like that. <laughs> um, so let's get into a little bit of the science of it. So what exactly is happening in the brain uh, during these experiences with psilocybin? Yeah, it seems to be similar to many of the other medicines that have uh, DMT as the primary analog, right? So psilocybin turns into psilocin in the system and it lasts about four to six hours. Um, and DMT has the um, receptor profile that locks in at every cell in the system, especially in the brain, that activates this um, transpersonal state. And so it's evolutionarily advantageous for us to experience transpersonal states. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a receptor profile for it. Yeah. And it's very likely that we get flooded. This comes from Rick Strassman's work. He did um, work on NNDMT, which is very similar to psilocybin, which is 4-phosphoryoxal DMT. And in the NNDMT experiences clinically, that was a very similar expression of the psilocybin data we were just talking about, that the vast majority of people had this transpersonal state that was a lingering experience of, um, you know, all of the, the in varieties of religious uh, experience when William James starts talking about these transpersonal states, they're, they're similar in their, in their flavor. It's ineffable. There's a sense of oneness and unity consciousness. Um, there's a sense of a noetic understanding, which is like tr truth greater than I've known before or truth somewhere outside of my ego. And there's a lingering positivity with the recognition of how everything is interconnected, especially with medicines like psilocybin, which come from the natural world. Many of the natural medicines, because they come from the natural world, help us remember our connection to the natural world. And the fact that it's, yeah, we come from the earth and it's also important for us to pay attention to our relationship with the earth, because if we're not living sustainably, then we're going to negatively affect the generations to come. So these are some of the insights that start to come when these natural medicines start to get engaged again in either a reverent context or <laughs> using them for purpose, not to say that medicines can also be enjoyable used recreationally, but when we're using them for purpose, then we tend to understand and appreciate and get the, the information and use it more effectively. Yeah. Does this have a lot to do with the default mode network? It seems like most of these are working with kind of taking that, that default mode offline. Yeah. Most of the psychedelics, at least that we can see in the current research seem to dampen down this default mode network in that midbrain arena, which is also connected to the fear center. So it's notable that as the, and the default mode is essentially, um, as Michael Pollan described in his book, How to Change Your Mind, where he just, he, he calls the default mode network the address of the ego, right? So you go into this area where our ego seems to be most held and lower the activity there while you're engaging activity in all these other arenas including the visual cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, this, this area of memory consolidation, witness perspective. So all these areas start to come online. So we get new experience. We get new novel ways of seeing the situation or learning or growing while our ego and all of our defense mechanisms are able to calm down and not 
because the ego is usually trying to fight to stay in control. Yeah. We are, well, these medicines are really about like massaging it so it doesn't feel like it has to hold on so tight. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and transition to our next one uh, in the interest of time because I could go on all day with this one, but um, ketamine. You know, we're, we're talking now about a synthetic that has been used for a long time. It is legalized as well. So as physicians, we can we can prescribe this. And it's because of the impact that that has been seen with the the response. Yeah, ketamine is another fascinating uh, medicine. It's it came out of veterinarian medicine as a horse tranquilizer. And then it transitioned from veterinarian medicine to human medicine and surgical studies and trials where people went under anesthesia using ketamine. And if they had an experience with treatment resistant depression or chronic depression, many of them came out the other side of that surgery feeling better. Yeah. So not only was it cool because it was a new novel molecule and potential treatment, but it also turned some of psychiatry on its head because prior we thought, well, we're going to either medicate your symptoms with psychopharmacology or you're going to have to talk your way out of it. Well, you had people that were going into deep surgical states and then coming out, didn't have to get into any kind of narrative, but started feeling better. And so ketamine is also not a classic psychedelic. It's more of a dissociative. It's, it has a very unique feeling tone to it. You want to explain dissociative a little bit? Yeah. So a dissociative encourages the psyche to feel distance from its usual experience of reality. So you tend to dissociate or, or disconnect from life as usual, from your experience of self, or your identity as usual. Many of the medicines work that way. Ketamine just, to, just tends to work so much that way as its principal modality of efficacy and how it gets into what it uh, is able to do. It does, as you mentioned before, quiet the default mode network. And as a dissociative, it gives uh, this great uh, appreciation and like platform for which to see things very differently. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is the is the larger dose, the dissociative dose. So there's there's degrees of the dosage that are being used right now in clinical practice. Yeah. So um, I think it was Lily that just came out with S-ketamine, this nasal spray that you can use. And essentially that's like a micro dose. Mm -hmm. It's a subsyndromal dose. You're not going to get the huge dissociative experience, but their belief is that if you trickle it in, you'll get some of a somewhat of a similar experience that if you have a flood dose, mm -hmm. and a flood dose is going to be something like five mg per kg or 50 or so milligrams IM or IV. And there's a bunch of different routes of administration. You could take it orally, you take it intranasally, those tend to be less of the breakthrough unless you use a higher oral dose, like 200 plus milligrams. And what seems to happen, this has been my, because we've used it a lot. I've been running a traumatic brain injury center and people with traumatic brain injury, depression and PTSD with this experience of also some degree of pain syndrome. When you bring ketamine into that constellation it's like a magic bullet yeah just by working with treatment resistant depression alone it's also very effective because it works on the default mode network and it seems like the flood doses work better at the default mode because you get that separation and ketamine is very good too in working with people with what's called ruminative depression it's kind of like their records stuck on eeyore you know unhappy mode <laughs> and yeah. it has a way of of snapping that out, like advancing to the next song, so to speak. The usual treatment regimen is six to 10 sessions. When you do that in a therapeutic environment, we are really getting preparation with a, a trauma trained therapist or somebody that knows psychotherapy into the material a little sooner. And then you're integrating the experience on the other side. My Experience has been that you don't need six to 10 sessions. You can oftentimes get by with less. Yeah, I've heard of people that had treatment resistant depression that a single, um, you know, the, the single larger dose experience of the IM or the IV had a, I mean, profound effect with complete resolution in one session. Right. 
And that can happen. So you're talking about the deeper dose. For many people who have that immediate reset, it won't last, which means you might need to do another one a week, two weeks, a month down the road. But it has been my experience too that when you get into the flood dose, you do get the reset. And then you have somebody coming out and now they're able to see life differently, see themselves differently. But again, at the end of the day, I don't believe that the medicines are here to save us. Right. I think the medicines are here to show us our truth, show us our work to do, um, give us a, a reprieve in the stuck patterns that we've been just limited by. And then once we have a little bit of freedom and a little bit of levity, then we can get some traction. Then you get into nutrition and movement and optimal mindset and more of the performance arena, which is what you guys are very good at. So it's this really good cat. I see the medicines as catalysts, right? They stimulate a reaction to happen faster than it would have happened otherwise, or maybe it wouldn't have happened at all. And so when you can stimulate it and you can catalyze it, then you can accelerate its, its efficacy. Yeah, I love that because, you know, the metaphor I'm seeing is that record that keeps skipping and bouncing back on the same track each time. And, and the, these, these medicines are able to kind of bump it and, and say, okay, move forward. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So ketamine is, is really interesting. I'm fascinated with the, the mechanism of action of ketamine and um, I'll give you my, my kind of uh, basic concept of, of what I, I see in the experiences of the ketamine is that, the it, I know it, it blocks the NMDA receptor in the in the transmission of the spinal cord. So what it seems to do for people during these experiences is it it kind of removes the sensory input from the body. So um, they they don't have that noise that's coming in from all the senses of the body. The um, you know the 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 touch, the temperature, the sound, and and all of this. And then it the interesting thing is it floods the frontal and prefrontal cortex with uh, glutamate. So, you know, turning on the higher cognitive functions while taking away the noise of the, the environment mm -hmm. seems to be an interesting aspect to me. Yeah, it's, a fasc <laughs> it's fascinating how it's able to do both. Mm -hmm. Many of the psychedelics are described as thalamic expanders. So you have more information coming in from the sensory body and the, the periphery. Ketamine does the opposite. It's more like a thalamic contractor. So you have less sensation coming in while you still have great opportunity to be able to look and pay attention, especially if you're in that kind of sweet spot of the dose, right? If you go, if you go anesthetic dose, then you don't have any of that happening up at the front, or it's happening to such a degree that you can't now have conscious recall of it. Yeah. But to be able to find that sweet spot, and most people will find a sweet spot. You start at 0.5 mg per kg, you know, because it's dose dependent, up to about one to 1.2 mg per kg, right? So some people will find their sweet spot around um, that like, 50 to 60 kind of milligram dose. And then they'll say, oh yeah, that's exactly where I find my sweet spot. If I don't have enough, then I don't get that, that quite the dissociation. Or if I have too much, I don't come back with any recall. And I actually want to come back with recall because it gives me a lot of information to use. I've heard people sharing experiences with the ketamine where they're able, and, and this is fascinating to me that I hear people recalling memories that they had no recollection of. And then they would confirm it with relatives of saying, you know, this happened when I was five years old. And they're like, oh yeah, that was, that was something that happened, but they had no conscious memory of it. And it seems like even after a single dose of it, it's, it, it progresses over the course of time. So even a week later, they're still calling up these memories, but they're able to look at them without the emotion of the memory. So especially in trauma where they've suppressed a memory, they're able to bring it up and look at it as an observer without the emotional context of it. Has that been what you've seen? Yeah. Part of the reason I think that happens is because the default mode is still quiet or it's quieter than it has been. And if it was an event that had some kind of emotional charge, especially if there was some kind of trauma involved, we get really sophisticated at bringing in ego defenses that 
that keep that traumatic experience or that really high degree of discomfort from rattling our system. So we tend to like, you know, put it in the closet. But the ketamine metabolites will stay in the system for a number of days and continue to work. And so if the, if the default mode is still quiet and they're still in that reflective process, you can still harvest a lot of repressed memory or just curiosity. It doesn't necessarily have to be a repressed memory that was like uncomfortable or something really um, negative. But this is another reason why it's, it's really important for people who are doing ketamine work to recognize that spontaneous trauma can be recalled. And if you don't have the context to be able to support somebody through it, it can be really disruptive for them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to open it up to, to some questions. We haven't had any posted yet, and I don't know if they were waiting for me to kind of open it up. But if we have questions, we have about five more minutes left. And so I want to open it up. If you guys have questions, post them in the chat and um, we will try to answer them. Um, but Dan, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, there are a few different ways. Uh, one of my websites is drdanengel.com, D-R-D-A-N-E-N-G-L-E. Another is fullspectrummedicine.com. Uh, I offer free hour-long um, group uh, question and answer sessions regarding integration. That's kind of my community service back. I just I want people to have an opportunity to ask questions about integration from transcendent states. It doesn't necessarily have to be medicine work, but many, a lot of people are working with medicine and don't have a whole lot of support. Um, so that's fullspectrummedicine.com. We're about to open our Kuya Center in Austin, although probably going to get delayed a little bit um, <laughs> As is that because of a lot going on. Um, yeah. But we're going to build our own online platform to have these kind of conversations and to be able to build a larger network of associated therapeutics and, a, and an arc of transformation to be able to support people through a guided process. Um, Kuya is K-U-Y-A, and I think that website comes live within the next three to four weeks. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you have a little bit of an interesting uh, story about your, your life experience. Uh, you spent some time uh, in the jungle. I did. Yeah, that's how I got introduced to this whole process. I was uh, running an integrative psychiatric clinic in Portland it's about 15 years ago. And then through a series of events, I was introduced to ayahuasca in an underground community. And it completely opened up my whole world. I learned more about myself in one weekend with ayahuasca than I had in one decade of psychotherapy. <laughs> so I closed up my practice, moved down to the jungle, lived in the jungle for a year, and uh, just studying with the medicines, no other green goes, no running water, no electricity, just really kind of in that pure um, listening mode and investigation mode. And um, there are a lot of medicines that are just now becoming more and more popularized for better and sometimes for worse, because particularly with a lot of the natural medicines, we have to think about sustainability and, and reciprocity and, and how to do all of it in a good way. Uh, psilocybin, makes a lot of sense because it's so easy to grow and mass produce. But I think we're just seeing the, the front line of this whole field of transformational medicine that's about to kick off. Yeah, it'll, it'll be exciting times. And, you know, I wonder if, if the current events will, will help to accelerate some of that process. Um, that would be, be a great, uh, great effect of, of this, this kind of uh, paradigm shifting time that we're in right now. Well, we don't have any any questions coming up. So if you guys have questions that come up later uh, as you watch this going forward, uh, you can post them in the in the chats, and uh, I'll be sure to to try to answer as best I can or uh, get the answer from from Dr. Dan. But I appreciate you taking the time um, yeah. uh, while we all sit at home right now and <laughs> <laughs> try to figure out what we're doing. Yeah, totally. But I, I definitely appreciate it, and I, I look forward to uh, when you get down here to Austin. Yeah, likewise, Dan. I look forward to staying in touch. Thanks for having me on. All right. Take care, Dan. Yeah, you too. Okay.